Hello, good day to you, or well, good evening when you see this. Um, my name is Adrian Howard, and I'm from Transformation and Design Church located in Dover, Delaware, 702 Maple Parkway. And um, where the pastor is the Reverend Dr. R.J. Chandler Sr. And we've been reading this book called The Emotionally Healthy Church by Peter Scazzaro. And um, so we're going to do a Bible study today. And um, the Lord had led me to Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel. Uh, you can find that uh, after Psalms and Proverbs and Isaiah and Jeremiah and the nations. You know, you get to Ezekiel. All right. Now, this is it's beautiful. The chapter is chapter 11 uh, that we'll be working out of. But for now, we'll just understand who Ezekiel is. And I think that he's perfectly fit to use for an emotionally healthy church, you know, uh, how to be emotionally healthy, especially in a emotionally unhealthy world uh, as it as it is now. You see, Ezekiel lived in a time where the worst things that could ever happen to Israel, Jerusalem, uh, and the, uh, the temple, everything came crashing and falling down in his time that he lied, that he lived. So uh, this, by all accounts, is the worst time for the Jewish people. Um, now, he was also a contemporary of Jeremiah. And so you figure Ezekiel, which was, um, he came to his, his calling about 598, 97 BC, which is, um, roughly, uh, basically, you know, 600 years before Christ. Um, so, uh, we know Isaiah lived about a hundred years earlier than that, you know, 700 BC. Jeremiah was, he's a little older than Ezekiel. Now, when these people come to be called, it's usually around the age of 30 years old when, um, they become priests and Ezekiel was a priest, um, in his time. And, um. He was rather, he was younger at that point. You know, he was close, more closer to, to 30. Um, Jeremiah, however, was, I would think he was probably, probably like 30 years older than him at that point or a little more. Um, but he's an older, older man. And now what happens in Ezekiel's time, he's prophesizing uh, when we're reading the stuff when the the Jews have began to be exiled out of Jerusalem and Ju Judah, the area of Judah, so this calamity is going on at this time, and what happens is all the time God was talking about if you don't obey my covenants and my statutes and things like that. I'm going to, you know, take you away. And he was sending messages constantly. Now, a little while before Ezekiel's time, Josiah was the king. And he kind of halted things for a little bit when he became king. And he, uh, they found the book of the law, which we believe is like Deuteronomy. But a lot of scholars believe that as well. Um, it's probably the book of Deuteronomy. And, um, and he found, you know, his, uh, Actually, Hilkiah, which was um, Jeremiah's father, found the book in the walls of the temple. And Josiah re reformed the area. And so they, uh, the calamity was like on pause during Josiah's life. But then uh, he, when he died, then his sons took over and they did evil just like Josiah's father and grandfather did. Um, 
earlier, you know? It, you know, Josiah walked in the uh, ways of the Lord like Hezekiah did, you know, which is like, uh, you know, maybe it's like his great grandfather or so forth. Anyway, um, is uh, when we look at things, we look at the situation of Ezekiel. He was already deported. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king, deported the Jews in three stages. It's funny when I do the study, it looks like they came back in three stages too. But um, he deported them in three stages. The first stage in 605, like Daniel uh, left and, uh, and things like that. And the second stage, uh, Ezekiel left. And of course, the king left, you know, and all their family. And so forth at the time, which was like a son of um, Josiah. Um, there, if you look in Kings, Second Kings, like the twenty-second, twenty-third, twenty-fourth chapter, you'll start to see the transition in Second Kings. If you go in Jeremiah, you can find the same thing. So Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Second Kings, also Chronicles as well. They talk about these things, different parts of First Chronicles and in Second Chronicles. They they really, uh, they all of these are working together. You'll get a good or a more complete story of what's going on at the time. And so he's dealing with emotional crises going on. So it's, uh, he, he's just the, the right person. You see in his writings and things like that. He's also known as one person to put like the most dates on it chronologically. Um, so you could follow his books and his writings. He was a man of uh, a lot of visions and dreams and God moved him and took him to places. And, you know, you know, sometimes in these dreams, it seems like he's being transported for real. So, um, but he tells a real account of, of his story and his, his time with God and God showing him and telling him what to say. You know, when he was, when he was talking to the people, especially in Babylon, he was, um, you know, he used a lot of different um, antics to get their attention and things like that. So it, it it seems like a lot of us as Christians don't do not really read Ezekiel a lot. You know, also like Leviticus, you know, things like that. There are certain books that it doesn't seem like we gravitate to the most. But um, I know it was a little challenging for me to get myself to look at Ezekiel throughout the different years, but um, the more you read and you know a story, you 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 tend to uh, like it. Um, so I'm encouraging you. Uh, I like to read it. I read it in the King James Version and um, I read in the New King James Version a lot. Uh, today I'll read scripture from the New King James Version. Um, and uh, you, you'll, you, you'll get a better understanding. Get a study Bible. It's good for studying <laughs> the word and understanding and putting things together. You can get a you know a whole picture of what's going on. So in chapter eleven is this time where um, where this vision came and you have these people that are left. Now the first wave is left and the second wave is left uh, deported. Um, Nebuchadnezzar has deported these people and you know you're talking about like 10,000 people a clip you know so maybe about 20,000 people have left so far and um, and you figure the the ones that are now left like the walls didn't come down in Jerusalem so they're holding they think they're good you know at this time they think they're safe um because when Nebuchadnezzar came, he, you know, he took from parts of other parts of Judea and like Jerusalem is kind of like in the air land of Benjamin and in the land of Judah, you know, kind of at the same time. So they reached Jerusalem, but they didn't destroy everything. You know, they took stuff, they ain't plunder it like in destroying it. You know, they might have took some stuff, well, which is plunder too, but um, but they didn't. They didn't take everything. I mean, they didn't destroy it. And uh, they went through a series of kings, and Nebuchadnezzar put 
other kings in place and you know different uh sons of josiah and grandson um were there so um some other people since the regular nobility is not there some other men are now in charge especially in the temple and what's going on so they start making the country to observe other idols all over again like manasseh and Haman, you know did they it's it's just bad they went right back to idolatry and so you know god is getting heated up his anger is getting heated up they're provoking him to anger at this time and yet they think they're safe like oh nobody's gonna come get us we are safe behind these walls you know because uh jerusalem's walls was nice and we're safe in the temple and so forth and um and they start having they're killing people a lot of violence was going on and they're killing people in the streets and all kind of stuff leading them doing all kind of mischief so this is the backdrop this is the setting of what's going on and um and god is upset with them. so in the first part of chapter 11 it reads like this then the spirit lifted me up and brought me to the east gate of the lord's house which faces eastward now when you hear this eastward stuff you think of the garden of eden and when um uh, adam got kicked out of the garden he had to go east which is a bad thing same thing with cain he had to go east when you hear that something bad is happening all right so they're in the temple right now uh the temple gates and they're facing eastward and this is kind of where they put up bad images and they you know they came and put up like all oh, some pagan gods and all kind of stuff going on all right so um which faces eastward and there at the door of the gate were 25 men among whom i saw Jazaniah, the son of azor and pelatiah the son of benaiah princes of the people so you know they're a nobility you know it could be some princes real princes of the king but they're like basically they're royalty and nobility and he said to me son of man these are the men who devise iniquity and give wicked counsel in this city who say the time is not near to build houses so they don't build houses the city is the cauldron and we are the meat so meaning that they're like the protected pot and the meat is in the pot and you know they're safe all right all right therefore prophesize against them prophecy O son of man then the spirit of the lord fell upon me and said to me speak thus says the lord th thus you have said O house of israel for i know the things that come into your mind god said i know what comes into your mind all right you have multiplied your slain in the city you killed a lot of people basically you have filled its streets with the slain therefore thus says the lord god your slain whom you have laid in the midst in its midst they are the meat and this city is the cauldron but i shall bring you out of the midst of it you have feared the sword and i will bring a sword upon you let me flip the page so it says says the lord god and i will bring you out of its midst and deliver you into the hands of strangers and execute judgments on you you shall fall by the sword i will judge you at the border of israel then you shall know that i am the lord this city shall not be your cauldron nor shall you be the meat in its midst meaning like nothing can save you you know god is going to come in and he is going to get have uh 
the enemies come through the walls and they are going to get you and bring you outside the walls. You understand? You're not safe. Um, I will judge you at the border of Israel. So he's saying, once I basically deport you and get you out, I'm going to judge you there and send you where I send you. All right. Um, then you'll know. All right. And you shall know that I am the Lord. For you have not walked in my statutes nor executed my judgments, but have done accordingly to the customs of the Gentiles, which are all around you. You know, you went basically God is upset with them. You want to go and serve all these other gods and they were like serving the sun god at this time. Um it was they was doing all kind of stuff that was um really unnecessary. All they had to do was keep his statue, but now nah, they want to be like everybody else. No, you set apart from the Lord. You understand? And once you set apart church, you follow in his ways. You can be emotionally healthy that way. There are laws and judgments that God has already in place when we're not doing what we're supposed to do. You become emotionally unhealthy when you're not listening, when you're not being obedient, when you're not loving, when you're not sharing, when you're not giving, when you're not forgiving. Trust in the Lord the whole time. It's beautiful. And so here God is taking Ezekiel and his visions and he's taking them to places and he's talking to them. And he got angels there and all sorts of things are going on uh, with Ezekiel. And he's able to see and look at the people, even though he's in Babylon. He can go and see these people exactly who they are. And God will do that for you. God has done it for me. When you're walking in his ways and you're in that place and you're walking with him, you're focused on him. He can communicate with you. He can tell you the things exactly and show it to you. Not only tell it to you, but he could show you. These are your enemies. This is how you got to get out the trap. They're con conspiring against you. And this is how you get away. You'll meet this person. You talk to this person or give this person my word. Or you face these people and you tell them you're a child of God and you ain't scared. You can be focused. You don't have to worry about the gossip and all those things. There's laws in Leviticus against people who gossip against you. Things happen to them. Ah, oh, that's how leprosy is started. You can go back. Leviticus 14. Look at these things. Um, let me just carry on. Let me read. Uh, this is Ezekiel 11 verses 13 to 25. And this is the beautiful part. So now it happened while I was prophesying. So he's was saying while I was doing exactly what God told me to do, go and prophesize, right, to the people. Um, he's in Babylon prophesizing. Now, one of the men that he named earlier, um, Pelatiah, the son of Benaiah, he died. So God must have struck him dead or killed him somehow. All right. He was too fed up with him. All right. And then it says, then I fell on my face and I cried with a loud voice and said, oh, Lord God, will you make a complete end of the remnant of Israel? Because these are all men of nobility. And, you know, people are being captured, you know, captured now. Now, Babylonian, they really just displaced them. They they brought them back to Babylon. Um like the nobility and that's normally what kingdoms do because they, they really still want the land. They want the gold and silver out the land. They want to extract um, everything and they also want to put its own people there, you know, maybe for vacation or something, whatever they want to do. Um, but they take the stronghold, the strong people uh, at the top and displace them and put them somewhere else. All right. 
Uh, many of us know about that in our history. So anyway, then I, um, I'm sorry. It's again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, your brethren, your relatives, your countrymen, and all the house of Israel in its entirety are those about whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said, get far away from the Lord. This land has been given to us as a possession. Therefore say, thus says the Lord God, although I have cast them far off from among the Gentiles, far off among the Gentiles, and although I have scattered them among the countries, yet I will be a little sanctuary for them in the countries where they have gone. Woo, is that not beautiful? So he's telling Ezekiel to tell the people in Babylon, don't worry about it. I got you. Although I have scattered you all the way from Israel. I'm going to take care of you. At the same time, he's telling the people over there in Jerusalem. Ah, what are you saying to my people? You don't know what's going on. You don't know. You don't. Your mind is not my mind. You didn't know. I took these people out because these are the same people I'm going to spare their lives. This is the remnant. Have you not forgotten what I've done in Egypt? Ah, to keep Israel alive. He sent them to captivity in Egypt where there was food and there was land and kept them alive and people alive to a day that they can come and get the promised land. And he's going to do it again. But now this time it's Babylon. All right. He sent them back. To the same area where about um, Abraham was at, you know, in that same general area. All right. So um, basically, you got to understand what God is doing. He's saving his people, although it looked like it's crazy. It looked like the worst has happened to him. But sometimes you got to pull them away and keep them safe. He pulled them to his chest. And say, hey, there ain't nobody going to touch you here. Now, these other people that's left there talking all this junk behind the wall, they're going to die. Yeah, you understand? There was like one more deportation. And then um, that was it. They killed so many people and they stormed and plundered and burnt the city. They did a lot of stuff. And um, the people who was left, um, you had some poor people. They left to do the farming and vine dressing. And there's people that they brought to Babylon. Everybody else they killed. All right. So God knew what he was doing. All right. Therefore say. Thus says the Lord God. I will gather you from the peoples. Assemble you from the countries where you have been scattered. And I will give you the land of Israel. And they will go there. And they will take away all the detestable things and all the abominations from there. Then I will give them one heart and I will put a new spirit within them and take the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statues and keep my judgments and do them. And they shall be my people and I will be their God. But as for those whose hearts follow the desire for the detestable things and their abominations, I will recompense their deeds on their own heads, says the Lord God. So the cherubim lifted up their wings with the wheels beside them and the glory of the God of Israel was high above them. Now, glory, ah, glory means weight and significance. Isn't that a beautiful way to describe God, his glory? It means weight 
or significance was high above the angels. So the angels lifted up in this vision. The angels lifted up. He saw the angels lift up high in the air and he saw God's weight and significance. You know that God was in there. It's kind of like looking at the sun, but better than that. You know, it's beautiful. Um, and the glory of the Lord went up from in the midst of the city and stood on the mountain. So this is how you know God was there, which, which is on the east side of the city. Uh, that could have been like the Mount of Olives. Uh, then the spirit took me up and brought me in a vision by the spirit of God into Chaldea. So now this vision took him into like Chaldea, the, the area of Babylon um, to those in captivity. So he went to his people and the vision that I had seen went up from me. So I spoke to those in captivity of all the things the Lord had shown me. So it's um after the vision was over, either he went and spoke to the people or the vision took him there and he spoke to the people. But um it seems more like um after his vision left of everything, he went and he then he just gave them the message of how good God is. God is gonna be a little sanctuary. So imagine like yo, you're in a you're in a countryside, a rural area. And that rural area is like a safe place for you. Or you find a little church right there. You couldn't find no church around, but you found a place to worship God. So wherever they go, wherever God sends them, he said he's going to be a little sanctuary there. No matter where you go, I got you. I'm ubiquitous. I could be everywhere at the same time. I'm with you. I brought you out to save you. Emotionally healthy. Be emotionally healthy. You don't have to worry about it. You're good. I know you here, this pagan God, but you're good because I'm a great God and I love you and you're my remnant. We can move on. Ah, praise God for it all. So I hope this has been something good for you. It's getting a little dark out here. So, uh, you know, I love you and, um, if you can, read the book, The Emotionally Healthy Church by Peter Scazzaro. Uh, study and read. Get your study Bible. Read Ezekiel. Study Ezekiel. Study Kings, especially Second Kings. Study Jeremiah. Ah, oh, it's beautiful uh, what you learn. Okay? All right. My love is with you. And always turn to God. Peace.